Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Socola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. My guest today is Mark Nikolich, CEO of Brascom America, a Brazilian petrochemical manufacturing company. Mark, welcome to the show. Good morning, Laura. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Tell us a little bit real quick, what does Brascom do uniquely? Sure. Brascom's a Brazilian petrochemical and polymers manufacturer. We produce globally in three regions. Uh, and essentially what we what, what our products end up in is, is your av- everyday lives, food packaging, healthcare, uh, COVID masks, those types of things. And, and so we make polymers and plastics in the end. Uh, but I would say we're also very focused on sustainability as, as we progress forward in the future state of Brascom. We're looking at post-consumer recycled plastics and how do we take recycled plastics and waste plastics and move them back into useful life in, in society. So uh, that's what Brascom's about. That's great. And you know, whereas we all like to think we would like to not need plastics, perhaps environmental and what it, it's part of daily life on so many levels we need it and to be able to make it more sustainable, so much the better. Have, have your cake and eat it too, as it were. Yeah, I feel they're critical raw materials, but also society has to figure out how to deal with waste, right? And we have yes. to figure out how to deal with waste plastics in a very responsible, environmentally responsible manner. That's Absolutely. terrific. And in order to do that, then who do you need to influence? Wow. Uh, it's really broad <laughs> today in my role. Uh, and I kind of prioritize things. Um, uh, if, you, if you think about the environment that we've been in for the last 12 plus months now, I think the most important uh, aspect for me to influence today, the most important stakeholder for me to influence today are the team members. Uh, The team members are the ones that are going through this uh, transition in society about how how do we work today? Where do we work? Where is the workplace? What's my career look like? Uh, What does my job look like in uh, a pandemic scenario? Will we ever evolve? Am I working in the office or not? So point being, I think the communication to the teams and being very, very present with the teams, and we'll talk about presence a little bit, but the appropriate presence with the teams is extremely critical for me uh, over these last 12 months. And then externally, uh, uh, I'll say with, with the world's focus on, on environment and sustainability, there's a huge amount of influence that we have to do with NGOs and the local public and educating uh, around the use of plastics and the disposal and reuse of plastics. So those are probably the two critical uh, stakeholders that I'm worried about today. And in doing so, what's the biggest communication challenge that that Brascom is facing? Or you well, personally? I'll get yeah, I'll get really personal. Uh, Great. Uh, it, 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 I'm I'm always on the move. Uh, I spend most of my uh, days prior to COVID traveling the globe, communicating directly with people, speaking in front of uh, large audiences, speaking in, in, in front of influencers, whether they're NGOs, whether they're our teams, whether they're our clients, whether they're our, our, our suppliers, um, even uh, in the case of uh, government stakeholders, right? So um, the most difficult thing for me is moving all those virtual and how do I connect with all of those, uh, all of those different stakeholders? It's been a real challenge over the past year and being comfortable in front of people is a little different than being comfortable in front of the screen, right? And so I think that's been my big challenge with communication to those stakeholders is migrating everything to virtual and having the frequency, the cadence uh, of that communication with them. Tell me about the comfort piece that you mentioned a moment ago, because we all like to think that whoever's at the top is perfectly comfortable with whatever comes along. And in any context, right, it's all no. just falls into place. What's awkward or uncomfortable for you about being virtual? Um, I, I have grown up in the commercial world, so I'm, I'm a commercial guy by, by experience. And so I think I, I didn't realize before how much I read body language, how much I look at individuals, listen to them, uh, look at their, at the, at the cues, their microaggressions, their, 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 their emotions, uh, as they're speaking, as they're communicating, as they're listening. And I think that's the biggest challenge, especially in rooms. So when it's one-on-one, when I'm just talking to you, uh, that one's pretty comfortable. When I'm in a room and I can't read the whole room, that's mm-hmm. very challenging. And I was very used to that prior. And now I've had to find other ways to do this and to make myself more comfortable that my message is being delivered um, and it's being received properly. How do you so, know? What's, what's something you look for now to indicate to you that your message is being received properly? Because I think a lot of people feel that way. So you yeah, it's well, body or this bodiless head, I should say. Absolutely. I, I ask a lot more. Um, I, I would normally just 
speak and read. Mm -hmm. And now I speak and then I ask, um, does that make sense? Do you understand? And I'll call on individuals to try to get multiple perspectives so that both myself uh, as well as the team feels like everybody received the same message. So I'm much more deliberate about that. Whereas before I would, I would read body language and be like, I got the cues. I'm good. And that might have been a fault, actually, because you, you think you've read the cues. Sometimes maybe you didn't get all the cues, right? Sure, sure. Being explicit in your communication can is yeah. never a bad thing if you're looking to get clarity, for sure. Exactly. The, what specific skills did you have to learn or develop in order to be successful as CEO? Well, I, I, I think naturally um, public speaking came to me. Uh, um, but you can speak a lot and not be heard. So uh, I think as I became CEO, the clarity of the message was really important. Uh, the delivery of the message was really important. And so I've really focused on those two components. Do I have the right critical message? Are they simple? Is it an elevator speech? I need to have elevator speeches. I don't know about everybody else, but if you give me a, a five minute diatribe, it's too long for me to remember. I need that tagline that says, you know, I just went down 10 floors in the elevator and the person I was talking to understood completely the concept before we hit the ground floor. And so I think about that elevator speech mentality and then this connecting. Uh, and you can do connecting in public speaking with a lot of people present. You can do connecting in public speaking in a virtual environment. Um, they're slightly different how you call people out, how you identify people, how you connect to the team is slightly different. Uh, and I've had to learn that. Um, how do you, my, my, I'll give you a really easy example. Um, when I speak publicly in front of a lot of people, I, I like to single out Laura. Laura knows exactly what I'm talking about because we were doing this podcast the other day, right? I, I like right. bringing people from the audience in, in, in interactive. You have to be careful about it spreading it around, right? Don't always mm -hmm. single out the same people, right? Um, you single out people from multiple functions that do very different things in the organization or at very different levels in the organization, but you can single people out. Uh, it brings the audience closer into the conversation. People are like, oh, my my buddy next to me, you know, had a little dialogue there, with, had a moment with the CEO, right? Sure. Um, on, on the digital front, it's a little harder. You have to be really deliberate. I have to take myself back, look at the screen, look at gallery, pick people because my eyes aren't just roaming over a crowd and I see people, right? I have to go through in a digital way and pick people and then call on them and kind of engage them and bring them in, right? And it's it's much more challenging to do that, especially if you're speaking. Because if I'm speaking to a group, I can do that, you know, I can do that just with my eyes, right? right. In a digital environment, I've got to kind of take my eyes off, look at the screen a little bit. And so I have to do that in between when I'm making comments, a little different. Yeah, a lot absolutely. Different. <laughs> a, lot <different>. a lot different, <laughs> as a matter a of fact. Yeah. Right. When there's a room full of, I don't know, a couple hundred people versus. Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes it's just you on the screen, maybe one yeah. other person. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something that's that's extremely relatable for just about everybody else out there, whether or not they were used to speaking in front of hundreds or thousands at a time, suddenly seeing themselves in a little dot when they're yeah. on screen is, is can be really oddly disorienting for a lot of people. Then and, what? and I don't, one, one more comment, Laura, sorry. Yeah. I don't like looking at myself. This is another problem, right? I don't like hearing myself. I don't look at, like looking at myself. So uh, the team always jokes with me because I do a lot of videos uh, and I can't watch my own videos. But I think that's another piece of this is you're used to always looking out and now you're kind of seeing yourself and others on the screen and, and it can be disconcerting. Sure. And I, I'm so glad you brought that up because there's, I think that's one of the most universal uh, feelings of of awkwardness and self consciousness for so many people out there feeling like I don't like to look at myself on camera. I don't like to see hear my own voice. I don't that that sudden hyper awareness of your own presence. And it's it's important for everybody else out there to hear that people who are at the top still feel that awkwardness. It's it's a human principle. It's not something that necessarily goes away with. Uh, positioning on the org chart, that this is something we all get past. And it's part of why when I'm, for years, when I do coaching or training or anything, uh, I always say none of my clients escape the video camera. We will always use video because you need to see and hear what everybody else sees and hears so that they are, uh, so that you know the reality of what you're projecting. And to the extent that we like to, uh, that we 
love to be able to avoid that. The reality is when you met in person, who's the only person who didn't know what you looked like? Right. <laughs> it's us. So Exactly. So this is actually, I, I try to do a mindset shift with my mm -hmm. clients that this is a great equalizer. Now, the fact that you get to see yourself on video, you know, okay, is there a mustard stain on the shirt? Is my hair doing something really wacky? Is there lunch spinach between the teeth or whatever it is? This is your chance to ensure that nobody sees or hears anything other than what you want them to, because you can fix it immediately. So this is uh, something to, to a better way, I think, to look at it and recognize that this is good for you in, in for those of us who are control freaks. Um, I think it's great. It's great training. It's great learning. Look, for, for those in your audience, and I've had this done to me too many times, but have been videoed and then critiqued videoed, right? Sure. You know, uh, for purposes of crisis management or, uh, uh, you know, press engagements, those types of things. It's tough and it's much nicer to do it. Do your own team's meeting. Yes. That's my recommendation. Do your own team's meeting, schedule a team's meeting with yourself and go and talk to yourself on the team's meeting. And that should help you get more comfortable and remove that shock of seeing yourself if you don't like that. Right. Right. Desensitize a little bit. Exactly. It's something that uh, I tell my clients is what I call my broccoli lesson, because much like if you've got kids, then kids don't want to eat broccoli and vegetables. They'd rather eat treats and snacks and chips and those kinds of things. But if you make sure that they eat their vegetables little by little, they'll grow up big and strong, be better off for it. And they might even develop a taste for it along the way. So <laughs> exactly. using the video of recording yourself and watching is, is my broccoli lesson, is our broccoli lesson for them. And it is something also that uh, it, it, I would never tell, have a client do something that I wouldn't do for myself. I've been on video for years. I've learned to watch it over the years because I need to see what I'm doing effectively and what I'm not. And I'd never necessarily learned to like it. You desensitize to it, you right. appreciate it uh, and the value that it's, that it brings, but you don't ever have to learn to love it. That's not the goal per se. And I always tell- I'll never I mean, learn love and seeing myself on video. No, <laughs> no, no. I tell people, A, you can bring popcorn, feel free to watch it, you know, and then you can always assume the physician and those who are watching on the YouTube channel. And if you're not, uh, if you're listening through a podcast, you can always check out my Speaking to Influence uh, YouTube channel channel, but you can assume the position and sort of you know, cover your hand, cover your eyes with your hands and just peek through your fingers if it helps you feel better in watching those videos as it does for so many. All right. Then Great. with all of that, it sounds like you've, you've learned many lessons along the way and how to do things well. Is there one that you learned the hard way? Yeah, I've had a lot of hard lessons. I think, well, look, the hard lessons, while they're impactful and they're emotional, um, I, I think, uh, uh, I think they they leave lasting impressions with you, and you learn most from them. For sure. Um, so I, I, I'll give you I, I'll give you some uh, a, a really difficult, uh, challenging speaking faux pas that I didn't even realize that you know you walk into these things and you don't think. And this is part of the point. This is part of the point. This is the point. Mm -hmm. Is I didn't think. And so uh, we had a plant that we were building in Louisiana, and so we were kind of connected to New Orleans and. It was Mardi Gras season, and uh, the literal, tra literal translation of Mardi Gras uh, has to do with Tuesday and mm -hmm. eating too much. And I made the comment about that Tuesday, uh, and uh, um, and I called it the Tuesday name that Mardi Gras indicates. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew subconsciously, I didn't know consciously, subconsciously, there was a woman in the room named Tuesday. Oh, and I did not contemplate. I that didn't was even her first think name. of. I, yeah, I didn't even think about it. And afterwards, she came up to me and she was like, I was hurt that you used that, you know, that that name for, mm. for Mardi Gras week and everything. And, and she was absolutely right. And my first reaction was like, come on, I wasn't using it. But that's not the point. Yeah. The point is how she felt it, right? And I felt like such an idiot afterwards that I will never, you can see, I avoid saying, yeah. I will never say the word, the name again of that Tuesday, right? Sure. So, um, uh, so, so that's an example of not thinking when you're making an off the cuff comment that you think is actually engaging the audience. Everybody was wiped mm -hmm. out. Everybody was working really hard and it was a celebratory week in Louisiana and uh, I offended somebody in the room, right? Uh, when sure. I was trying to engage them. So that's an easy example. And I think part of this for me is about knowing your audience, right? It's always yes. about knowing your audience. So, so the other quick lesson I learned is, is you get too technical and uh, you use 
acronyms and you use buzzwords and you use all of this slang from your industry and your yep. little environment. And you don't think that everybody outside of your environment doesn't really associate with those words, those names, those acronyms. And, uh, and you can do this on a level uh, where you're trying to, to communicate to executive leadership and you're using too many details from the business. I work in an engineering type of business, right? Sure. They call vessels by numbers. You're talking to a commercial guy and you're telling me about D402 vessel. I don't know what that is, right? So, so how do you cater the message to the audience, right? And that's really important when you're speaking, when you're presenting, when you're communicating and you're trying to progress. Knowing your audience, I think that is a crucial lesson for everybody. And you're so right that it's easy to get stuck in the lingo and the alphabet soup of your industry and everybody's industry, whether you're in education or you're in government contracting or you're in petrochemicals, pharmaceutical research, whatever it happens to be, everybody's got their alphabet soup that doesn't spell anything in anybody else's language. Right. So, so critical. And you feel comfortable using it. Right. So you use it because you're in a position of maybe discomfort because you're presenting to executives or whatever the situation is, right? And you go to your comfort zone. And this is a lot of the work I try to do is push myself out of the comfort zone into an area of discomfort. Then I know I'm really learning, growing, and then I know I'm really identifying the pitfalls. Exactly. Perfect example. Thank you, Mark. Ben, what's the next big goal for you and for Brascom? I, for for Brasschem, uh, uh, probably the nearest thing on the horizon is a sale of the business. So mm -hmm. the entire company uh, is for sale. And uh, as I mentioned before, we're based in Brazil. So, you know, one of the, and, and, and this has been going on for a little while. Uh, it's been going on during COVID. So it adds to the tension uh, and the criticality of staying engaged with team members. Sure. And, and uh, it's a time of uncertainty that's on top of more uncertainty that already exists, right? With uh, uh, social and racial injustice in society, we've got, uh, I'll say, all kinds of political uh, tension, not just in the U.S., but across the, across, across the world. Um, and you've got COVID and you've got concerns about economy, about jobs, about uh, the future, um, and then all of a sudden you say, we're for sale, right. uh, you know, and, and so uh, you can imagine this is a time where we're trying to keep the team members very stable, keep very close to them, uh, make sure they're feeling very, very comfortable in their work environment. And without communicating exactly what's going to happen, because it's an unknown, it's a, it's an open sale, communicate the process and some of the things that make them feel more comfortable, right, and keep them comfortable. So that's our biggest challenge, I think, over the next 12 months, if, if it takes that long, six to 12 months. And how do you then ensure, how do you communicate with your team, your, at least your national team, if not your global mm -hmm. team, that you're safe, that you should not feel the instability, don't let it affect you in your productivity or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But, oh, yes, on top of COVID, on top of whatever else that's going on in the world, um, we are for sale. And who knows what will happen when that it occurs? Yeah, it's a tough uh it's a real tough one because um, uh, you can't just say, you know, suck it up. Uh, no. that's, that doesn't that doesn't work, right? Uh, it offends people. It's not the right message. So you really have to. So I focus on a couple of things. Try to focus on something you can tell them that is uh, concrete. And one of the things that's concrete is the process, not how much time it'll take, but the process that you go through, due diligence, and this is what will happen. And so making them feel comfortable that this is what our shareholder is going to do. This is the process they're going to do. They're going to hire an investment bank. This is what happens. We create, you know, we, we gather data, we create a data room, so on and so forth. So I'm walking them right now through the process. And that gives them in their mind's eye a little bit of view of how this is going to play forward as opposed to being totally silent. And then they just get announcements out of the blue, right? And I'm not telling them anything unique, anything proprietary. I'm not speculating. I'm just talking about a typical M&A process that they're normally, the, the bulk of the team members are not involved in. So now they feel like they're part of the process. They feel like they understand the schedule, at least the sequence of events and what might be happening along those sequence of events. And that, that creates some comfort in knowing. And uh, I don't expose the company to uh, issues associated with non-disclosure and issues associated with the sale, right? So it's a way of communicating and bringing them, uh, bringing them on board, bringing them closely. Um, you know, explaining to them that everything's gonna be okay is uh, unrealistic, right? So you have to 
layer in some uh, some realism uh, in, into the discussion. And that's probably the most difficult part, but I think that's the most genuine, you know, when we talk about communicating and how do you connect to people, this genuineness, um, this being transparent uh, and being transparent that, yeah, it's not gonna be perfect for everybody. And there could be negative fallout, right? Uh, is part of is part of this communication process, and like I said, that's the to me that's a tough, that's conflict, that's emotion, right? And these are the things that um, create most of our challenges as we communicate. So uh, so focus on the process, and then we do have a bunch of team members that have been through this before, and I know it's a big surprise, but they all turned out okay. <laughs> right. So, so, you know, give me examples, clear examples. I, I try not to use myself as an example, but I will use myself as an example. And this sure. is that I've been through uh, five um, purchases, sales of businesses, six, maybe six now at this point. And um, I've seen productive team members always end up on top, always end up in a better place uh, because they go at it with gusto. They go at it with, uh, you know, this is an opportunity for change. Uh, this is an opportunity for me to influence. This is an opportunity for me to be even more productive, to have a bigger impact on the company or what I want to do with my career. And, uh, and so I try to sprinkle those stories in to help, to help the whole. I try not to use myself too much because they're like, well, you know, you're privileged. You're the white male CEO. And, and so I, I try to really use other examples in the organization that have a little more breadth to assure them that there's a lot of people that come out better in this situation than they would have if if the company wasn't sold. Sure, sure. Well, Mark, this brings us then to the Listener 24-Hour Influence Challenge. Okay. This is your opportunity to talk directly to our audience and challenge them to take one step that they can complete within the next 24 hours to have more influence. How would you like to challenge our listeners today? Okay, so I'm going to go to a really personal place for me, okay. uh, which is peer relationships. Okay. And uh I believe most companies, maybe all organizations, social structures have some type of hierarchy and it's implied up and down. What's not implied is across, right? Mm -hmm. And, and so um, sometimes these peer relationships are really close because you're good friends. Uh, sometimes these peer relationships are very abrasive because you view the world very differently than your peers. And of course, the backdrop for all of this is you're probably all competing for the same jobs or the same next job or something like that, right? So there's always this competitive context. And uh, I feel that that creates tension and inefficiency in peer relationships. And the peer relationships are really what drives the productivity in an organization, not hierarchical movement, right? That's not how things get done. Things get done between teams, between peer teams and between peer leaders. So my challenge for all of you is choose a peer that you work with, that uh, the two of you working together could improve the productivity of the company markedly. Uh, but this peer has to have some tension with you. So you're not 100% comfortable with this peer. You have differences in agreements, you have different processes, you have a different way of going about things. You're introverted, they're extroverted, whatever it is. I would like, to challenge you to wade into that, set up a meeting with them, explain some of the challenges that you have with, with, the, with the relationship, explain what you think you can do to improve your behavior, to engage more with that peer team member and ask them to open up to you. That's the final piece of it, right? And this can be a very simple conversation. Um, it can start out very easily and I'll give you, I'll give you the opening. It, the opening is, is Laura, you and I have worked together for a while. We've never, you know, we, we, we haven't always seen eye to eye. And I think if you and I work together better, we can progress this company and our teams uh, far better. And so I'm here uh, with uh, an open mind to share with you the things I think I can do to work better with you, Laura, the things that I feel like I can do to help our relationship. Um, and I'd love to have that dialogue with you and see if the other team member opens up. I so, it. uh, and, and it, it takes some courage. These are, these are what I call zones of discomfort. This is walking into this uncomfortable space. But I think once you walk into that space and you come out the other side, uh, 
regardless of how it goes, you'll feel like you've made progress as a leader. I think that's really powerful, Mark, to to be able to uh, engage with somebody in a com- conversation that is inherently going to have a bit of discomfort. But look, we talk a lot about nowadays about stepping into the discomfort and accepting the discomfort. And it doesn't have to be just around race or gender or those kinds of things. It's just, okay, we have creative tensions or differences in personality, differences in communication styles, whatever it is. But open the door, acknowledge the elephant that's in the room and say, okay, how can we work better because it's in the best interest of the company? And frankly, it'd be nice to just have a better working relationship. Why not? Why wouldn't, what's, what's the downside to that? Uh, And I love that uh, if everybody out there was listening and if, if you zoned for a second, go back and replay the last minute or two, because he, uh, Mark, you gave everybody a great opening sentence as far as how to initiate the conversation, because most people are willing, but as the expression says, that first step is the doozy. And you, you know, in your mind what you want to accomplish, but you open your mouth and nothing comes out. And you just can't quite figure out what those first few words need to be. How do you get the conversation into first gear? So uh, I, he just did a terrific job of framing for you a great way, whether you're going to write it in an email or or put it into a voice memo or pick up the phone, call them, et cetera. So do engage with your peer, somebody on equal footing, uh, in however you want to define that, and and just start taking that first step to smooth over those relations for a better productive environment for everybody. I love it. Yeah, I think it'll be great. And like I said, even if it doesn't go well, I usually feel liberated at the end. And at least I know that I've let that other person understand how I feel and understand how I see the situation. And this is is something you've done a number of times, right? Yeah, with success and failure. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, I, I, and and, and I'll I'll reference, uh, um, one example for me, if you're familiar with the disc profile, the disc profile. Sure. Uh, uh, so, so I'm a D. Uh, big surprise. I'm, I'm I'm more in that dominant, vocal, uh, action oriented quadrant. And uh, I have a peer that I've worked with for a long time. Uh, uh, very accomplished. Uh, he's he's a C. So he's much more of this conscientious. He, he likes he likes data. He likes absorbing understanding and then forming an opinion and i'm much more emotional and action oriented right and sure. and you can imagine how these two views can conflict with each other um i want to hear you know i also border on the on the eye so i want to hear rah rah i want to hear we can do i want to hear action uh and this peer wants to see the plan Yep. And wants to see the numbers behind the plan and wants to see some of the data and who's going to do this. And do we have the bodies and all of this? Right. And so, and for years I was looking for him to do the cheer. And for years he was looking for me to provide the really nice book and, that tells everybody what to do. Right. And we yes. were just missing each other. And, and uh, you know, over the years we figured that out and through some coaching help for both of us, uh, we came together and shared those views. And now I know to cater things in more of a factual plan mode for him. And he knows I'm looking for a little more emotion uh, <laughs> uh, in, in his messaging, right? And and that's just a, a, a simple one that, it, it sounds simple on paper. It took four, probably four or five years of us working together to figure all of that out. And now we have an extremely productive uh, relationship that I think um, uh, helps drive the company. So that's an example of of a good one. Vulnerability as a leader is something that is hard to embrace, but necessary to embrace yeah. and yeah. to be willing to put yourself out there, to take the risk, to, to extend the hand first. Some are going to take it and some aren't, and that's okay. And you kind of need to know who's going to and who's not going to anyway. So you might as well just find out. With then this finally brings us to the speed round. And these are a couple of topics that are regularly that regularly come up with clients in training and coaching. And there's a lot of myths out there that we're going to do a little bit of busting on today with regard to are they really black and white? And if not, then where's the gray? So I'm going to ask you first to pick the black and white, and then we'll prompt for some of those other shades in between. First, public speaking, love it or hate it? I love it. Can you give, because not everybody does, so can you give a couple of uh, a tip for everybody out there who's not so comfortable with it for how they can manage nerves and speak with confidence, even if they don't feel it? I still get anxious. 
I have more of an excited anxious. <laughs> it's like, I want to get going, right? But I still have anxieties, right? And you can feel that. And that's okay. You should. Um, because uh, again, if you're, if you're speaking in front of a large audience and you don't feel some emotion, then you're probably not delivering a good message. One of the things I focus on, and, and, and this is really for the physical crowd, is um, you want to look at them, right? And this is another reason why I don't, write, I don't speak from notes. I don't speak from scripts. is because I want to look at the crowd. For those of you uncomfortable looking into eyes, look right over their heads, just right over their heads. They think you're looking at their eyes. So just yeah. look right over their heads. You don't need to stare them in the eyes. You just right over their heads. They think you're looking at it and it engages the audience to you. Would you consider yourself, and I think I know the answer to this one, but do you consider yourself an introvert or an extrovert? Um, I'm extroverted. And what do you think is, is a strength of being an extrovert? <sighs> and what's one of your areas for growth? Um, I will tell you, it's easy for me to come into a situation and, and break the ice. Uh, okay. And you always need that in the room. You need icebreakers. Sure. Um, you need somebody that's going to uh, point out the elephant in the room. You need somebody that is going to break uh, the tension or the silence. Having said that, there's a huge watch out that I always am, am, am conscious of. It doesn't mean I always succeed in, uh, in removing this weakness associated with my extroverted behavior. And that's talking over people. Hmm. Um, you really have to focus on stop and listen, stop and listen, and only use that extroverted voice, that sort of invasive uh, voice um, sparingly. Use it where it's needed. Don't use it all the time. It's a little like leadership, right? It's all individual. Read the room. Does the room need you to be talking over everybody? Probably not. It might need a little jump start. Okay, provide that, but don't go beyond that, right? And so that's the watch out on the other side is, don't talk over, stop, listen, listen to all. And then go from there. I love it. Finally, Mark, handling conflict. Nobody likes it, but we all have to deal with it at some point or other. But what about, how are you hardwired? Are you more, when you're faced with conflict, do you naturally want to avoid and run away or do you want to just dive in and address it head on? I, I hate conflict. Uh, um, I, and, and let me, let me frame conflict. Like I, I like, I, I'm very comfortable with business conflict. Uh, we have a contract that's a disagreement around interpretation of, mm -hmm. I'll wade right in emotional conflict with people. I'm not a big fan of, right. And, and, sure. uh, I, I don't know. Most people I know are not big fans of that conflict. Those that wade in and look for emotional conflict, um, uh, a lot of times are picking a fight, right. So I don't like that emotional conflict with people. I, I, I like the harmonious state. Um, but as you know, uh, that's not the normal state, right? That's not the real state. And harmony is not always, always there. So, so you do have to push yourself. And over the years, I've just trained myself to, um, to really just kind of grit your teeth a little bit and wade in and start to feel, right? And start to feel the conflict, um, uh, make sure you understand the breadth of the conflict, feel the emotions from multiple, multiple sources mm -hmm. hear a lot, but I try to, I, I, I try to avoid creating conflict. Okay. Um, now once you have conflict, uh, this is another one of these areas of discomfort, right? And this is the, uh, Oh crap moment that people talk about where you get that knot in your stomach and you have to push yourself forward and through. And uh, I'll give one example of, 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 of conflict that um, I was involved in and I figured out how to at least minimize it. And, and this has to do with my teams. I'm very, uh, I'm protective, I'm defensive, okay? And earlier in my career, it was, it was explicit. You, you, if you even made a comment that I interpreted as attacking my team, how dare you, right? And I would, mm. I would respond uh, inappropriately emotionally push back. And, uh, and I actually had to train myself to, to feel that emotional trigger and all these emotional triggers. If you concentrate on them, all these emotional triggers are slightly different. You can feel it. So now if somebody critiques my team, I actually know I can recognize this defensive emotion that comes up through my body into my, I can feel it coming. And I really have conditioned myself to, to not hold it down, but recognize it and then ask questions. Hmm. So Laura, 
explain more. I, I need to understand more about my team. Expl can you tell me a little bit more deeply about how my team's failing? Can you tell me how my team could be better? Mm. Can you help describe this? Can you help uh, help me with solutions for my team so that I explore more and I invite the person that's giving the critique in instead of shutting them off with this defensive response, right? And so I do think you can train yourself over time to recognize those emotional responses that have to do with people conflict and, and train yourself not to close off and not to amplify, right? You really want to open up and you want to ask these open-ended questions that I'll say uh, reduce um, uh, the, the conflict, you know, that, that heightened tension, reduce the tension and allow dialogue to happen. And that's how I get through them. That's how I get through them. Yes. The, it's funny, the, there's um, one of the most famous negotiations professors and experts out there, Stuart Diamond, who's been at, at the Wharton School and you know a bunch of other phenomenal business schools, uh, always says that the best response to I hate you is thank you, tell me more. Tell me more, exactly. Tell me alone. why, tell, yes. me, tell me why, tell me, tell me more deeply how you're feeling. Yeah, absolutely. And it's tough, it's tough because your first response is emotion. Sure. Sure, you know? that defensive and, 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 and a lot of it's primal. It's like, well, I'm going to fight back, right? And that, that, and that escalates. It doesn't de-escalate. And that's where it's important, I think, to when something like that comes at you, not to react, but to respond. So that, exactly. don't let the fight or flight instinct take over, but take a step back, acknowledge your desire to fight or flee, and then from there, make a slightly more measured response before yeah. you move forward. I appreciate you bringing that up today because it's yeah. something that's so difficult for so many people. It's hard and don't think it's easy for anybody. No. It's not. Even the best, you, you, when you pry a little bit, they're like, no, it's really tough to do that, right? Right. But, you, you don't but have you're to really like good it. at it, but it's really tough to do, yeah. Yeah, you can do it well. It doesn't mean you have to like it in the process. I don't exactly. think anybody truly likes it. Then Mark, how can people learn more about you and Brascom America? Sure. I think, um, well, well I, I direct you in two places. Um, we're pretty active on LinkedIn and uh, I really spent the last year developing LinkedIn community that um, I'll say uh, shows the global breadth of the company. Uh, and you'll see a lot on digital and sustainability as we try to progress a, an old industrial business into the future. Uh, so I would recommend uh, 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 connecting with Brasschem on LinkedIn. As well as going as well as going to our, our website, there's a lot of information on our website about sustainability, especially if you're interested in circular economy and how we how we as a society take waste and reclaim it and put it back into uh, into use and in, in, in productive use in society. Terrific! Thank you so much for joining us today, Mark. It's really been a pleasure. Thanks, Laura. I enjoyed it, and uh, have a great rest of your shows. And uh, I really appreciate having the opportunity to chat with you today. And thank you everybody else for listening in as well. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating on iTunes so we can help even more people increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And finally, if you want to download my quick start guide to mastering the three C's, command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.